Thank you very much. So, uh, actually, I'm a medical physicist working at the University Hospital of Würzburg in Germany and um, doing some research on ketogenic diet together with my colleague Ulrike Kemmerer, who is advising patients on ketogenic diets for many years now. And together we, we founded the uh, German Society for Paleo Nutrition recently to provide a broader basis for all the people interested in the paleo lifestyle in Germany. Now, originally, I was supposed to give this talk together with my colleague, Dirk Lemke. You can see him up here. And he should have uh, spoken about the roles of exercise and vitamin D in cancer prevention and treatment. But unfortunately, he was not able to come to this uh, symposium. So I changed the title a little bit and will concentrate on the diet part today. So what I'm going to do is to relate uh, certain aspects of a Paleolithic diet with uh, biological mechanisms that play a role in uh, cancer initiation and progression. I think most of you agree with me when I say that cancer can be considered a disease of civilization. And this notion is supported by uh, reports from the beginning of last century, uh, which stated that there was almost, almost no cancer prevalence among primitive hunter-gatherer societies, including Eskimos, African tribes, American Indians, or tropical islanders. So this immediately leads us to ask, what has changed in our lifestyles that gave rise to the still increasing cancer rates? Um, most of you noticed already, and it was uh, recently pointed out by Carrera Busters et al. in a nice paper, that the, the main uh, lifestyle factors in which our modern lifestyle differs from a more traditional uh, paleolithic, diet, uh, paleolithic lifestyle include exercise, sun exposure with the accompanying vitamin D status, um, chronic stress, which certainly has a role of its own in modern diseases, and importantly, the nutrition. And uh, it has been shown that, for example, hunter-gatherers consume a diet which contains, on average, more protein and less carbohydrate than our modern Western diet. And especially carbohydrates seem to be important when it comes to cancer. That there exists a, a strong uh, relation between carbohydrates and cancer has been known since the 1920s, when several physicians found that tumor cells would take up much more glucose and in turn secrete much more lactate than normal cells, even under normoxia. And normoxia means normal oxygen concentrations. Uh, this is therefore known as aerobic glycolysis or the Warburg effect after Otto Warburg, who performed the most, uh, most well-known experiments. Now, usually when there is normoxia, um, a cell will take up glucose and convert it through gly glycolysis to pyruvate, which will then be transported into the mitochondrium uh, to yield citrate and fuel this, the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. And uh, normoxia will therefore shut down lac lactate production. But in tumor cells, this mechanism no longer holds, and most of the pyruvate gets converted to lactate by this enzyme here and uh, exported out of the cell together with protons. Now, um, the tumor cell has several advantages uh, by, doing a, by having a, a high glycolytic rate. The first one is that it, uh, it is independent of the actual oxygen supply in the microenvironment. And for, exa for example, aggressive tumors, they grow too fast for concurrent vascularization. They will, so they will al always have uh, hypoxic areas in which they depend or they have no other choice than to uh, use glucose as a fuel. Um, also, a tumor cell no longer re relies on intact mitochondria. And uh, if they have dysfunctional mitochondria, that allows them to evade apoptotic signaling because apoptotic signaling requires the presence of intact mitochondria. Now, third advantage is that uh, the lactate gets exported out of the cell together with protons, like I just said, and uh, the protons will disintegrate the extracellular matrix and um, lead uh, to apoptosis in normal, in normal uh, stromal cells. And this allows uh, tumor cells to more effectively um, proliferate 
and uh, invade and metastasize. And the fourth important point is that uh, glycolysis uh, yields um, high amounts of uh, phosphometabolites, intermediates, um, that can enter the pentose phosphate pathway to yield ribosis for RNA and DNA synthesis and redox equivalents for fatty acid synthesis. And in fact, every fast proliferating cell, for example, activated uh, T cells, um, they have a high glycolytic rate because of this, because they have to proliferate fast. Now here are some uh, data by Eggert Holm and co-workers, which just show uh, the, which quantify the Varga effect, basically. They have measured in uh, 19 colon carcinoma patients during an operation, the substrate uptake and uh, production in tumors and in peripheral tissues. And what you can see here is that for free fat acids and ketone bodies, there was basically no difference in uh, uptake or production. But when you look at glucose and lactate, you see that tumor cells would take up about 30 uh, fold more glucose than the peripheral tissue and on the other hand excrete about 20 uh, fold more lactate. Now, it has long been a question what co actually causes the Warburg effect and Warburg effect is also so intertwined with all the other hallmarks of cancer that you can uh, basically ask for the uh, origin of cancer itself. And the picture that emerged during the last 50 years um, is that it is genetic mutations that give rise to uh, hyperactivation of certain signaling pathways that will then, then lead to aerobic glycolysis, proliferation, etc. And uh, especially these are caused by gain of function mutation of certain oncogenes and loss of function mutations of uh, tumor suppressor genes. But during the last 10 years or so, um, a more complicated picture has emerged. And there are now many reasons to believe that these genetic mutations are not the primary cause of cancer, but they arise secondarily due to some other causes. And there seems to be a complex network of factors that can interact with each other and all give uh, independently rise to uh, tumorigenesis. For example, there are good reasons to believe that cancer can more be considered a disease of altered metabolism or a metabolic disease, like uh, Tom Sa Seyfried will tell you after me. Um, in this case, defect or dysfunctional mitochondria are the primary cause and only secondarily lead to genetic mutations. They can also lead to chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation by itself is, has been known for, I think, more than 100 years as a potent uh, stimulator and driver of tumor growth. Um, similarly, epigenetic modifications, for example, in, uh, silencing of certain tumor suppressor genes um, can give rise to the, um, the, to the uh, malignant phenotype. Um, also, hypoxia by itself and in aggressive tumors, we have hypoxic areas. Um, we'll make sure that these uh, tumor cells are dependent on glycolysis and they will upregulate their, uh, their glycolytic rate. And a very important point is that hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia uh, can both cause uh, defect or dysfunctional mitochondria and they can lead to chronic inflammation, which then stimulates all these uh, processes of tumorigenesis. So it seems that genetic mutations are necessary but not necessarily sufficient for cancer progression. And the microenvironment, for example, plays a very important role. And tumor promoters in the microenvironment uh, include for example, abnormal metabolism, an aberrant extracellular matrix, inflammation and fibrosis, the presence of growth factors like insulin and IGF-1, presence of certain hormones, mutagens, and reactive oxygen species. But the good news here is that mo many of these factors can be, in principle, countered by a paleolithic diet. For example, a paleo diet is usually a diet low in carbohydrates, and this by itself will lead to lower blood glucose levels. Now, blood glucose directly impacts insulin, and insulin indirectly impacts IGF-1, and both insulin and IGF-1, when they bind to their specific receptors, they will trigger a signaling cascade through PI3K, 
AKT and mTOR, which leads to uh, stimulation of proliferation and resistance to apoptotic signaling. Now imagine you have a, a cell which is on the border be between going into apoptosis or becoming malignant. Then chronically high levels of insulin and IGF-1 in the microenvironment, like they occur in patients with metabolic syndrome, they might lead to favor the malignant transformation of the cell. Um, dietary restriction is also could, could, be, could be considered part of a paleolithic diet, for example, in folks who do intermittent fasting regularly. And dietary restriction by itself will activate AMPK, which will um, then uh, have a uh, negative effect on the mTOR pathway. So um, let's go back one more time. Um, I want to stress that this pathway is also uh, frequently upregulated in many tumors. And this is uh, part of the cause that, part of the reason why tumor cells uh, have such a high resistance to apoptosis and such a drive for proliferation. On the other hand, the hyperactivation of this pathway by uh, genetic mutations um, renders tumor cells somewhat less flexible to the availability of nutrients and the metabolic pathways. They are more addicted to glycolysis. And therefore, the Warburg effect or aerobic glycolysis has been considered by some as cancer's Achilles heel and is now being explored, explored uh, for metabolic um, drugs, for example. And indeed, um, in vitro experiments have shown that uh, cancer cells are very vulnerable when you deprive them of glucose. However, Gene just pointed out that in vivo, this effect might be questionable because um, by gluconeogenesis, you always make sure that your blood glucose level has a certain uh, range or a certain physiological uh, value. However, imagine a patient who has uh, hyperglycemia and um, what you see here is um, the oxygen gradient. So this is distance from the, the closest uh, blood vessel. And you have here the oxygen gradient and the glucose gradient, it reaches fast into the tissue. Imagine the tumor and uh, here this area would be a hypoxic area. It's no longer reached by, by oxygen, but it's still reached by glucose. And uh, it, it's uh, well known that hypoxic areas are also the most chemo and radio resistant ones. Now, if you're able to lower this patient's blood glucose level, then theoretically, at least, you could um, deprive those hypoxic cells from the blood glu glucose supply and eventually slow down the tumor proliferation and lead to necrosis or tumor cell death in this area. But even if this mechanism does not uh, make a large difference in, in vivo, then we still know that there are some indirect effects of blood glucose. And um, we know this because, for example, starved animals, which have blood glucose levels on the lower physiological range, they survive long and have slower tumor growth than their normal fat counterparts. We also know that, and Colin Champ had a nice poster yesterday about that, we know that hyperglycemia leads to elevation of insulin and free IGF-1. It uh, leads to a state of inflammation or, or inflammatory signaling and uh, a competitive inhibition of ascorbic acid transport into immune cells, thereby blunting the immune response to cancer cells. Also hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, elevated free IGF-1 and obesity are all independent um, prognostic factors for cancer occurrence and poor survival in cancer patients. And it's important to stress that uh, these are all uh, hallmarks of the metabolic syndrome and it's it shows that cancer, uh, that cancer patients have very common, many things in common with those who have the metabolic syndrome. And this is because the tumor manipulates whole body me metabolism. In, uh, we know that in metabolic syndrome patients, the adipose tissue will excrete certain inflammatory cytokines. And in the cancer patient, these cytokines get excreted by the tumor tissue. Now, these cytokines will signal to the liver that there is some inflammation going on. And um, both liver and muscle will become more insulin resistant. 
even at a very early stage of uh, tumor progression. Now, in this early stage, already the uh, synthesis of glycogen in the liver and in, in muscle tissue is impaired. And uh, muscles do either have a normal fatty acid oxidation rate or they have an upregulated upre fatty acid oxidation rate, in which case this will increase the, increase the rate of lipolysis from adipose tissue. Now, with uh, more tumor growth as the disease progresses, we enter a late stage where the liver upregulates its gluconeogenetic rate and the substrate for that comes either from more breakdown of, uh, of fat from, from the adipose tissue, it, it comes from the lactate excreted by the tumor and it comes from proteolysis which uh, occurs in muscle uh, to yield uh, alanine, the amino acid alanine. And uh, this will be converted to glucose by the liver, further fueling the tumor. So this could be seen as a vicious cycle that develops. And the end result is that the cancer patient uh, loses muscle mass and he loses um, adipose mass and turns into a cachectic patient. But this also implies that cancer patients need fat and not carbohydrates. Because fat and ketone bodies they will, provide, they will still provide a fuel for muscle cells, even in the cachectic state, while they can hardly be utilized as a fuel by cancer cells. It has been shown that uh, if you increase the amount of fat in the patient's diet, this will lead to an attenuation of weight loss and fat-free mass loss, even if, if the patient's already cachectic. If you replace carbohydrates with fat, that will also um, lead to a lower glucose, insulin, and free IGF-1 level. And uh, ketogenic diets may have additional special beneficial effects. For example, ketones have been shown to block glycolysis, they act neuroprotective, and they interfere with signaling pathways like the mTOR pathway. Some in vitro studies have been published that show direct anti-tumor effects of ketone bodies, like, uh, for example, a study by, by Eugene Fine. And there are, there's a larger amount of animal studies which show that animals on a ketogenic diet will survive longer, they have less tumor growth, they have less metastasis, they show a genetic normalization of the tumor tissue, and they have uh, no loss of body substance, uh, a normal weight gain if you use an unrestricted diet, and the animals are usually fit in contrast to their normal fat counterparts. Unfortunately, there are, there's a lack of clinical studies. We are, all we have are some positive uh, case reports and preclinical studies. However, this, these studies give rise to hope that ketogenic diet is beneficial for the cancer patient. Um, positive effects that have been shown include weight stabilization or weight gain, an improved quality of life, diminished glucose uptake by tumors. Now, one study found that there were hints towards less proliferation of the tumor. Um, a study done at our clinic by Schmidt et al. showed uh, improvements in many blood parameters. And uh, you just heard the talk by Jean, uh, who showed that ketosis correlated with stable disease or partial remission in his patients. So one last point that I want to stress is that um, when you think about uh, doing a ketogenic diet for a cancer patient, it's important to not just focus on the macronutrients, but um, the quality of the nutrients. And this can be learned from the, the paleolithic approach, because in paleo diets, quality plays a larger role, usually, than just the quantity of macronutrients. For example, it's important that uh, the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio is uh, is not so high as it is in the standard diet because more omega-3 will lead to more anti-inflammatory signaling and uh, omega-3 fatty acids have, have been shown to have some beneficial effects against the cancer cachexia. Usually a payload diet contains no gluten and grain lectins. In this way, you are able to avoid additional inflammation. Uh, you can ideally substitute with a lot of coconut oil, which has these medium-chain triglycerides that get readily converted to ketone bodies. And usually on the paleo diet, you don't have to worry about vitamins and secondary blood substances. substances. 
and for example, from red wine, green tea, curcumin, broccoli, etc. And some, many of these substances have, to be show, have been shown, at least in vitro, to protect against uh, reactive oxygen species and inflammation. And they, they, uh, they are thought to have an epigenetic regulation of anti-tumor uh, processes. So to summarize this talk, a paleo diet, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go into other aspects of a paleo lifestyle, but they have similar mechanisms like exercise and vitamin D. So they can contribute to cancer prevention through reduced inflammation, normalization of blood glucose, insulin, and IGF-1 levels. They positively affect body composition, and uh, they have an epigenetic suppression of uh, tumor-promoting factors. And the same principles might improve the prognosis of cancer patients whereby ketogenic diets could be especially effective. Thank you. Uh, one question. Hi. Um, I have a girlfriend. She's 35, and she uh, looks very healthy. She's a dance instructor and stuff, and um, she's been a vegetarian her whole life, and she's just, um, sorry, been diagnosed brain cancer. Yeah. So I'm just wondering um, if it's possible for her to do a ketogenic diet if she's vegetarian, like just do all fats. Is that, can, is it, that still something that can help her? I think so. I, I, I would try it. So, I mean, you can uh, derive most of your calories from fat. You should derive most of your calories from fat. And this does not necessarily have to be animal fat. You can, coconut fat and palm fat are very effective uh, for stimulating ketosis. Mm -hmm. okay. So, and because right now she's following like a alkaline, alkalizing diet. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it, you know, just adding a lot more fat to that, uh, her vegetarian diet with that? Um, I don't know if grains and stuff are part of that for her, but is that, that could help maybe? Uh, I would make so. I would make sure that uh, she is in a ketotic state. I think that's important. Okay. Okay. So, it depends. Some people can eat as much as 60 gram carbs per day and be in a ketotic state. For some people, it's only 20 grams. That's individually different. But okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. And I think the next talk will address exactly that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Clement. Uh, we'll